happened, so. One of the jurors told me, none of y'all were talking about nothing, any of them, none of me. All got to speak up. I said, which one's not? Oh, loudly enough. Loudly enough. I see. They said, all of them. Well, talk louder. I've never gotten that complaint. I can tell you. Maybe they need to think. If you don't tell up here, I, I can't hear you. I, I'm hard of hearing. Yeah. If you're not talking into this, I don't hear what's been. Well, you're not a good barometer because you have I'm hearing not. problems. So, but I, I know if I can hear you. Yeah, you'll just keep your voices up. That would be helpful. We'll work on it. Can you hear me? Speak up, everybody. Everybody, speak up. The credit, if you can. I really, for years, wanted them to just drop some mics around the room. Oh no, that's too. You know, they can put all this. Hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment all over this courthouse, but they can't drop a couple mics. She like made it. that phrase famous, just drop a mic. Drop I did. Mic. Drop them. <laughs> just drop them down. <laughs> all right, y'all ready? Yes, Your Honor. Let's bring the jury back in. I am probably going to have to, you know, they do need to vote today at some point. It might be a 4.30, quarter to 5 day, just for your planning purposes. I, I don't want to. I don't want to be the excuse they didn't vote. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I did. Did you? Did you vote? I'm not going to vote and I go take my husband to the doctor so I can go to the haircut. When's your appointment? Okay, thank you ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Thank you and everyone may have a seat. Your next witness. Yes, Your Honor, the Commonwealth calls Bethany Bailey. Bethany Bailey? Bethany or Stephanie? Bethany. <coughs> See, he can't hear. <laughs> I've told, we, I, we've asked everybody to speak up. Bethany Bailey? Speak just one minute. All right. end today in between 4.30 and quarter to 5 for voting purposes. I don't want anybody to miss out. I don't want anybody pointing a finger at me saying <laughs> she wouldn't let us go. So I'm going to let must, you go. You must not be running. <laughs> 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 we serve eight-year terms. Uh, circuit judges serve eight-year terms. So you, you will only see uh, a circuit judge on the ballot this year if there is a vacancy and there will be one circuit court race. Uh, so we won't, we won't run again until... Thank you for doing that. Another four years. For letting us out to vote early. Thank you. You, you need to. I mean, yes. not, not, I'm not telling you what to do, but <laughs> I need to do that. Um, a lot of employees, uh, like the, the, a lot of the state employees, get a half a day off to go do that. For some reason, our, my bench clerk doesn't, 
so the county employees don't. It's very odd. So I do want to make sure you all have the time and opportunity to do that. Thank you. All right, is this Miss Bailey? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you, ma'am. If you'll um, make your way up, wind your way up, and watch your step <laughs> to the witness chair, please. You raise your right hand, ma'am. Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth? So help you God. Yes. All right. Now you're really soft-spoken. Scoot up <laughs> if you can. And the microphone is stationary, so it doesn't move. Okay. I'll need you to speak up, and you may ask. Thank you, Judge. Good morning. Could you please introduce yourself to the jury? Uh, I'm Bethany. Well, Arvid used to be Bailey, I'm paramedic for Louisville Metro EMS. And Bethany, how long have you been employed with Louisville Metro EMS? Almost five years. What did you do before um, your employment with Louisville Metro? Uh, I was an EMT at Yellow Ambulance for about four years. Okay. Um, now you said you're currently a paramedic mm -hmm. and you were previously an EMT. Yes. Can you tell us the difference? Um, a paramedic can do a lot more like life-saving interventions. I can give medications via IV, um, cardiac monitoring, advanced airways, that kind of stuff. Where I uh, EMT just does basic life saving first aid. Um, so, can, uh, going off of that, can you tell us a little bit about your training and experience that allows you to hold the current position that you do? Um, as an EMT, it's about six weeks of training. And then when I went further as paramedic, it was two years of training, um, class, um, hospital clinicals, and then about 400 hours of ride time on an ambulance. And did you respond to the shooting of Daryl Wilson on May 13, 2016? Yes. And tell us what you did when you got on scene. Um, when we got on scene, the other, the BLS unit that has two EMTs, was already on scene. They had already loaded him onto the stretcher on a uh, longboard and were actually coming out to us as we pulled up on scene. Um, so we got him in the ambulance threw him on the monitor, started helping him breathe, and almost immediately went on to the hospital. Now, you said us. How many people arrived for our ambulance? Two. Sorry. Okay. Um, who was with you that day? It was uh, Kyle Condor. Okay. And how did you all get the call out to a scene? How do you know to respond to a situation? We get dispatched by dispatchers at MetroSafe, and it comes across our computer at the same time. Um, actually, tone tells you out and tells you where to go. Sorry. Okay. Um, do you know what time you received the call out on May 13th? I, I don't remember what time it was. I think it was like 5, 6 in the evening. Okay. Um, does, do you generate a written report of the actions that you took in yes. treating Mr. Wilson? Okay. And if I showed you that report, would that refresh your recollection? Yes. Okay. I may approach you. You may. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. So you received the call out at 6.20, and what time did you actually arrive? We got on scene at 6.33. Um, so about 13 minutes, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned there were other people on scene, so you and Mr. Condor were not the first responders. No. Is that correct? Okay. Um, now, when you arrived, where was Mr. Wilson, the victim? He was already on the other ambulance's stretcher, actually making his way to us as we pulled up. What kind of condition was he in? Um, originally when I got there, he was unresponsive. Um, when we got him in the ambulance, he would occasionally open his eyes or move just to pain, but nothing purposeful. Was he able to speak? No. Um, and I think your report notes that he was responsive to painful stimuli only. Yes. Um, what type of stimuli were you administering to get a response like, from him? Um, when we moved him, it's kind of jarring to lift the stretcher into the ambulance. That got a little bit of a moan, kind of open his eyes, that kind of stuff. Um, when I went to stick an IV in his arm, he kind of opened his eyes. That was by as far as the responses we were able to get from him. And 
was he able to breathe on his own? Yes, it was shallow and we had to assist him. Okay. What did you do to assist his breathing? Um, we have, it's called a uh, bag mask that we just have to make seal on their face and we help them breathe on 15 liters of oxygen. I don't I'm not sure. Do you like better to explain it? You, <laughs> you gotta like, squeeze I'm it. Picturing this like balloon thing, and do you put yes, it you, you hold the seal on the mat, on the face, and then just squeeze every five to six seconds to help them breathe as they should at a normal rate. And what type of treatment did Daryl did Daryl Wilson receive on his way to the hospital? Um, cardiac monitoring. He received an IV and fluids on the way, and then we assisted his breathing for about, I think, four minutes to the hospital, yeah. Um, what injuries were you able to know? Uh, the main injury was that we were able to see he had a single gunshot wound to the left back of his head, a little bit above his ear and back. Um, we couldn't find, it looked like it could have been an exit wound. We weren't able to find any others. We didn't want to manipulate his head or neck anymore. Now you said it looked like it could have been an exit wound. Can you tell me the difference between an entrance and an exit wound? Generally, when we see an entrance wound, it's smaller or exit wounds. There's a bigger, they have more tissues, bone fragments, that kind of stuff around. And that's what we saw with this one. I said, I didn't want to manipulate his head and neck anymore with him being shot in the head and make any further injuries. Um, but you did see bone tissue yes. and fragments and things like that. Okay. Did you note any other injuries on his body? I did not see any, I mean, any other major injuries or deformities. Did you note any injuries on his arms? I don't, no, I don't recall any, and I do not think I mentioned any in here. No. What about his hands? No. What about his chest? No. What about his legs? No. Okay. No other injuries. Where did you take Mr. Wilson? He went to university into room nine. And what is room nine? Room nine is their trauma room. Um, that is where any critical patients, <coughs> gunshot victims, strokes, severe car accidents, uh, they would go as soon as they arrive. And Bethany, after you left Mr. Wilson at room 9, did you have any other involvement in this case? No. Thank you. Those are all the questions that I have. Please answer any questions the fence may have for you. Cross. <clears throat> Very briefly, and I appreciate that. coming in this morning. <coughs> um, did you have a long time to look at Mr. Wilson's body and identify injuries? No. So it's kind of a cursory. Yeah, I think I had him a total of six minutes, five, six minutes. Okay. And you didn't take any photographs or anything like that? No. Okay. Um, and you had said at one point that you did enter an ID in his arm, right? Yes. And he did have a response to that? Slightly. I'm not, like I said, at that point, I don't know if it was purposeful or if it was just, you know. Okay. But the Based on your training experience, do you think that he felt the IV being placed into his arm? No, I think he was just moving because. Okay, that's all I have. Cross, Mr. McLeod, any questions? No, I don't. Any redirect? Nothing but the You're excused, no. ma'am, and thank you. Thank you. Do you want this back? Ms. Gunjun, you want this Yes, Your Honor, if I may approach. Right. Your next witness, then? Commonwealth calls Detective Rick Burns. Rick Burns? If you make your way to the witness chair, please. Thank you. Yes, Your Honor. Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth? So help you God. Yes, Your Honor, I do. All right. You may ask. <coughs> Good afternoon, Detective. Good afternoon. Uh, would you would please introduce yourself to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury? My name is Richard Burns. Where are you employed? I'm currently employed with the Jefferson Town Police Department. I've been there since October of 2017, this past October. Um, prior to that, I was with the Louisville Metro Police Department since June of 2008. 
And when you were still at, at LMPD, what was your position there? Um, I started off in patrol, um, then in the 4th Division with LMPD, and then I became a burglary detective in that same 4th Division. Um, after that, I went to work in the homicide unit where I was assigned when this case occurred. And so, what's the difference between a patrolman and a detective in, in those job duties? Uh, patrol officers will, I guess you'll see them patrol, they're, they're assigned areas, they'll also answer calls for service when someone calls 911. Um, a detective is more of an office type, they're assigned different cases where patrol might take reports of, for example, a burglary occurs, uh, the report gets approved and assigned to a detective to be investigated. Do detectives work alone or do they work in, in teams? Usually teams. Um, some, some work you can do on your own, but um, a lot of times it requires teamwork. And so who's in charge of that team? A sergeant. And then you're on a team generally, but then once a detective takes a case, do they take it alone or, or can there be multiple detectives on one case? It really depends on the unit that you're assigned to, um, particularly the homicide unit. There'll be a lead detective assigned to a case, but there's many detectives assisting with the lead detective. Did you respond to a, a shooting scene on May the 13th of 2016? Yes, sir, I did. And were, were you the lead detective on that? How did you respond? How did you get that call? I was not the lead detective. I was actually out of the office at the time with uh, Detective Anthony Wilder. I believe we were returning our, on our way back to the office from dinner that night. Um, and they, the dispatcher came across our channel and let us know that the 4th Division had responded to a shooting and they were requesting the homicide unit. Detective Wilder and I were, were very close to the area, so we got on scene pretty quickly. And then, so you were the first two detectives that were actually at the scene? Yes, that's what I recall. And, and what did you do when you got there? Um, I spoke with Officer uh, Maybody, and he, had, it, he was kind of just briefing me on the situation, what they had, um, and advised me that there were three individuals that were present when they got there, and I, I believe they were the 911 callers. And so you spoke with that officer. Did you speak with other officers on scene as well? I did. Uh, there were two other responding officers that I spoke with. And did you also speak to the three individuals that Officer Maybody told you about? I did. I spoke with three of them at the scene, and later that night I spoke with two of them again in a more formal interview at our homicide office. And so who were those three civilian individuals that were there at the scene? Robert Hayes, Tanya Taylor, and Michael Mead. Did you approach? Good name. 